The Australian Financial Review. In early 2020, Hamish Douglas was riding high. Magellan, the investment group he built from scratch with Chris Mackay, had amassed more than $100 billion in funds under management, cementing his reputation as Australia's leading stock picker. His success made him both a billionaire and a celebrity, and he packed the largest ballrooms with his investor presentations. He created a perception that only he really understood what was going on in the world. He was so plugged in to the CIA, to the Federal Reserve, to kings and presidents and decision makers globally. And he had his finger on the pulse like no one else did. And that's all it is, it's just an image. That's the Australian Financial Review's rear window columnist, Joe Aston. Magellan's star began to fade after its investment performance was hit by a cautious position during the pandemic, coupled with some big calls on Chinese tech stocks that failed to pay off. And then a year ago, Joe Aston wrote a column on Magellan and Douglas that would rock financial markets. Welcome to The Fin. I'm Lisa Murray. Today, we talk to markets editor Vesna Polyak and senior reporter Jonathan Shapiro about the rise and fall of Magellan. And we go behind the scenes with Joe to talk about his column at the centre of it all. It's Thursday, December 8. So, Johnny and Vesna, you're a bit of an experiment for the Finn. This is the first time we've had two guests on the show. Maybe you could introduce each other. Well, I'm joined with Vesna Poliak, the senior markets editor who's been here longer than I have and knows more about markets than I do. And this is Jonathan Shapiro, a senior journalist at the Financial Review and Walkley Award winner. Great. So, Johnny, I'll start with you. Take us back to when the Magellan story first began and introduce the main players because the cast is really a who's who of Australian business. So the origins of Magellan can be traced back to 1990 and that's when two young analysts sat next to each other at a firm called Schroeder's and one of them was Chris Mackay and another was Hamish Douglas and Chris introduced Hamish Douglas to Warren Buffett. He hadn't heard of him until that point. And they both developed this passion for um, investing and investing in a certain way, uh, which is the way Warren Buffett would invest, a very practical, uh, value orientated. And Mackay instilled that into Douglas. They both went off and became investment bankers, did very well for themselves, became probably the two two of the top deal makers in Australian on the Australian corporate scene. But they always had this plan that uh, they would one day unite and build an investment firm. And in 2006, they decided that they would make their dream reality. Uh, they took over a defunct company that was set up by all people of by Malcolm Turnbull, the former prime minister. And that became the um, the corporate entity that they used to build Magellan. And quite a few wealthy Australians invested in it. And that included James Packer and Naomi Milgram. But I guess their big break was probably the global financial crisis when they were very conservative and um, held a lot of cash and, and outperformed almost every other fund in that environment. On December 20th, 2006, the Magellan flagship fund was listed with $378 million of funds under management. So, Vesna, what was the fund's investment strategy? The fund's management world is full of Buffett disciples. What did this pair think they could do differently to get ahead in the market? Well, global equities is such an important asset class for Australian investors, but no one had really succeeded there except for Kerr Nielsen's Platinum. Uh, Magellan came around and thought, well, let's take on global. And they did it with a huge distribution force, um, probably unlike anything we've ever seen here. They bought really well-known companies that were easy to market, like Yum Brands, Nestle, American Express, Walmart, and as John said, the global financial crisis came around. They didn't even lose a dollar. Um, They made 2% in that time. They beat the index by nearly 18%. In terms of the business, they were really set up for success when 
a British wealth manager, St James's Place, if you think about it, like an AMP, they awarded Magellan a $3 billion mandate. That was incredibly important for what would come next. And Johnny, what was the relationship like between the two founders? I think in the beginning they were they seemed very close, best of friends. They you know, they were former colleagues. They had this dream to start Magellan together and they did. And when they did create Magellan it went very well. So that only solidified this um partnership between Chris and Hamish. But as Magellan grew bigger, um there seemed to be a bit of a fracturing. Uh, it was it's never been acknowledged by the two men that the relationship parted, but there was often talk that uh, Chris and Hamish weren't as close as they were in the beginning. And over time, Chris Mackay took more of a backseat. I guess he could be described as the more bookish um, type, you know, loved looking at balance sheets and uh, analysing companies. Hamish was more of a figurehead or a frontman, and he seemed to thrive on... You know, being the the main person at Magellan, he was very ambitious. He had many a lot of plans about how to grow the Magellan corporate entity. The Magellan became less the Hamish and Chris show and absolutely more the Hamish show. Once Hamish took the reins, Magellan came into its own as a as a marketing company and um you know an asset gathering force and it's it's assets under management which are you know the the funds it raises from investors which it charges fees on. Um, went parabolic and that became great news for shareholders of Magellan because it, as the assets grew, the quantum of fees they charged grew and Magellan became the hottest stock probably on the ASX as, as it grew so rapidly. So Douglas's profile was growing in line with funds under management in Magellan. He became almost a cult-like figure in the industry. How did that happen? One thing about Magellan is it was masterful in marketing to financial planners, which, you know, they controlled a large pool of of the wealth of Australians. And Magellan had an excellent distribution person called Frank Casarotti. He knew the right ways to market to financial planners. And over time, Hamish Douglas became integral to that marketing. So having Hamish present, he had this aura about him because the fund had done so well that he he was an excellent investor. He was a, a step ahead of everybody. And over time, Hamish did more and more things to, you know, to create this perception. So one of the things he did was recruit ex-CIA operatives to his advisory board. He brought out the former Federal Reserve Chairwoman, Janet Yellen, to give him advice on the global economy. And the brand itself went mainstream when it sponsored the Australian cricket team, which was seen as a quantum leap for a you know, if a fund manager managing global stocks, all of a sudden its name was on the, the SCG and the MCG and that really elevated uh, the Magellan brand to, to the next level. But what stands out for most financial planners and, and certainly us in the media uh, is these big ballroom lunches that, that he would host. Um, I remember attending one in August 2015. There were 900 people there and Hamish dimmed the lights and he had the audience absolutely captivated and he was a really good um, storyteller and he would always talk about the macro but in 2015 he started to talk about technology, Google's and Microsoft's, uh, you know, this wave of disruption and that seemed to work really well. You know, he seemed to really resonate as he was building his own personal brand as Australia's next Warren Buffett. He, He kind of thrived on these events in 2017 um, he held another tour around Australia, and this time there were 2,000 people attending. So that those ballroom lunches were often thought of as peak Magellan and, and peak Hamish. But now that we look back, there was a moment that we can say was peak Hamish and peak Magellan, and that was Vesna's infamous lunch at McDonald's with Hamish Douglas. So in July 2019, um, the AFR had lunch with Hamish Douglas. The rule of the format is the guest always has to pick the venue and I was given the choice of the Strand Arcade, which is near the Apple Store in Sydney, or the Circular Quay McDonald's. Is this the first time you've done one of these in McDonald's? Mm. Yeah. I love the pickle. I just got a pickle. And we met there um, at the foyer. You order on the terminals and we took our trays upstairs where we did some photos and I think from memory he ordered an Angus burger. But he was pretty relaxed. Well, that was very nice. Thank you very much. You've been very generous. You're welcome. You better keep the receipt. No, I know. 
you know, Hamish is famous for having this incredibly intense gaze mm-hmm. um, and he was in quite good spirits. I think he'd just come back from overseas. Um, their numbers were extraordinary. They were just smashing everyone. In, in about a year's time, Morningstar would determine that Magellan was the number one global equities manager in Australia over the past decade. So at this point, I mean... I mean, yes, if there is a peak Hamish, this is uh, peak Hamish. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, one of the founding fathers of America, had this great quote. And his quote was that money makes money and the money that money makes, makes more money. And if you, that's what investing is all about, is finding a great investment that can compound for you over the long term. And then literally find it and sit on your ass mm. and let it happen. So that's what's happening the, the venue may have been a nod to Buffett, but they, they did own the stock and there's a bit of discussion about um, their investment style and and how people often try and overthink investing. Um, some of the best companies in the world are hiding in plain sight. That's something you often hear. And uh, funds under management were about to crack $100 billion, and on paper he was a billionaire. But then the pandemic hit and Magellan's fortune started to turn. Douglas made a big call and it turned out to be a wrong one. Tell us about that, Johnny. Well, it's fascinating because Magellan always had this reputation as a fund manager that will make you money in good times but protect you in bad times. And when the pandemic hit, there was real fear and concern around how long this would last. And going into the pandemic, Magellan were quite heavily invested, but they once it became apparent how bad the pandemic was or once the fears in March 2020 reached a crescendo, Magellan became very conservative and Hamish Douglas and the investment team took the view that this was not going to be resolved quickly and that we were entering a very dark period for stock markets. So he accumulated the maximum amount of cash that he could and he sat and he waited. We all know what happened next. Central banks pumped the system full of liquidity, governments came to the rescue with stimulus packages, and it was actually the most ideal time in a generation to own stocks. And if you didn't, you missed out on an opportunity that you'd never see again. And unfortunately for Magellan unit holders, it meant that they fell way, way behind the the stock market benchmarks. And that ultimately was bad news for Magellan shareholders because it meant that the performance suffered and they were more likely to suffer outflows. So that was an unfortunate uh, miscalculation for Magellan. Magellan started moving away from its core competency, which was buying stocks, making money. They invested in Baron Joey, uh, an investment bank, Guzman and Gomez and Finclear, which is a somewhat of a rival to the ASX. The point was all of these things were a distraction from the main game, which was investing. They also decided that the opportunity was there to own Chinese stocks. Now, Magellan's crosstown rivals, Platinum, had always been enthusiastic investors in Chinese companies. Um, Magellan had made its name and and it built its performance on investing instead in US stocks, and that had been the right call. But Magellan decided to own some of the giant uh, Chinese tech stocks like Alibaba and Tencent. But unfortunately, the timing there turned out to be very poor. Alibaba was his largest stock when um, the controversy around Jack Ma emerged and, and he'd vanished from sight for a few weeks. And that, again, cost Magellan uh, unit holders quite a lot. It, it was a call that went against him, one of many. And as a result of that, his performance slipped further and further down the league tables and it created more questions about Magellan's investing prowess. When Magellan started underperforming, it it wasn't for a lack of ideas or, or a lack of deliberate strategy. Um, they were hardly passive, um, but the market was really working against them. And when they tried to correct things, often they'd just suffer once again at, at the hands of market forces. If you remember around this time, Lisa, it wasn't just market strategy that had changed. Um, Hamish had stopped coming into the office during covid And there was a period of time where he just really hadn't had the same profile for a good number of months. So this major figure, divisive as he was, was suddenly absent and that got people talking. What happened next was the Daily Mail ran a story based on paparazzi pictures of James Packer's yacht, which was sailing in Saint-Tropez. And everyone at home noticed 
a small but significant detail, one of the guests on board was Hamish Douglas. So in hindsight, it was perhaps a bad look or unfriendly optics, but arguably that marked the beginning of the unwind of this exceedingly wealthy, influential and successful fund manager. So Vesna, we've been talking about Hamish Douglas's meteoric rise. In June of 2021, Magellan was valued at just under $10 billion, making both him and Chris Mackay billionaires, as you said. But decisions made during the pandemic, the big bets in China, took the gloss off the group's investment performance. And then Douglas spent the three months in Europe. Is this when some doubt crept in for Magellan investors? I think that's fair. Um They're very transparent as a manager, so everyone could see the performance was starting to erode. Um, What was important was the track record, so not so much the 12 months. Um, You know, often a difficult year can be forgiven, but they were starting to lose ground on this advantage they had set against the market over three, five and ten years, and that would cost them. So just before Christmas 2021, uh, he gave this interview, probably the first one that canvas the the run of underperformance that Magellan was suffering. And what was remarkable was a comment in there where he said that not one institutional investor, meaning a Magellan client, had questioned the fund's performance. And that piqued the interest of people in our newsroom, but it, everyone was talking about it. It also seemed extremely unlikely. There, there was a lot of rumours going around the market around Hamish Douglas and his personal life around the time of that article. And in the weeks leading up to it, our rear window columnist, Joe Aston, was sitting on information that he was certain was correct, that Hamish Douglas's personal life was in strife and he was likely to be separating from his wife. Now, the difficulty is, as financial reporters, is what is our role there? You know, is it is it up to us to report about people's personal lives and... Myself, Joe and others had lengthy debates around the appropriateness of reporting this and its relevance to the public interest. But as to the decision-making and the process, perhaps we can uh, hear from Joe himself on this one. So if you put yeah. those Is this, on. Am I in front of this one? Yep. Um, we'll actually swap you okay. guys. Yep. I'm Joe Aston. I'm the rear window columnist at the Australian Financial Review. So I consider my job to be calling out bullshit and... Uh, Thankfully, there is no shortage of it in the Australian market. Joe, you wrote a lot of stories about Magellan and the way Hamish Douglas was managing the business, but the one that had the most impact was the column where you made public his separation from his wife and the potential impact that would have on Magellan shares. This was a case where something very personal crossed over to the public interest. Talk us through the lead up to that story. Yeah, it was not something that I enjoyed at all. I can say I was really quite tormented by this story and how to handle it. I'm not sure I have ever or will ever spend as much time on the phone with Johnny as I did in that kind of month leading up to that. I had become aware in probably September of 2021 that Hamish and his wife had separated Hamish had told close associates he'd advised uh, members of the board of Magellan and it was kind of the hottest gossip in the Australian financial market. And, um, you know, it may surprise people to hear that I actually have a heart and and blood running through my veins, but, you know, you do not want to make someone's personal turmoil worse. But in the end, um, you know, we have to realise that Hamish had accumulated $115 billion of Australian retirees, mostly money, uh, and he was responsible for managing it. And, you know, there's a body of work that supports the thesis that money managers going through personal turmoil suffer from a performance downturn. And the other key public interest measure was that uh, Hamish and his wife Alexandra had been married for nearly 30 years. Uh, I've 
very much doubt there would be a prenuptial agreement. Uh, they have multiple children and they own 12% of Magellan. And it was right at the time Judith Nielsen had sold all of her shares in Platinum Asset Management through her divorce, ultimately, settlement, with her long-time husband, Kurt Nielsen, the founder of Platinum Asset Management. So, you know, you could see where this train was going. Maybe not within weeks, but certainly that the largest shareholding in, in Magellan was likely to be split. And then Hamish gave an extraordinary interview at the Sydney Morning Herald, and this was on the first Saturday of December last year. That denial that any investor had uh, questioned the performance of the Magellan Global Fund was just completely implausible. And it left a lot of people with their mouths on the floor. So talk us through the timeline. Hamish's comments are published on the Saturday. You start asking questions on the Sunday. On the Monday, Brett Cairns, the chief executive of Magellan, suddenly resigns for personal reasons. And then on Tuesday, you publish your column online. Did you talk to Hamish? I called Hamish on Sunday. He didn't answer. I texted him to say that I needed to speak to him and he didn't respond to that text. I then called the PR person at Magellan and I emailed a set of questions to forward to Hamish relating to his separation from his wife and to asking him to confirm that to be the case. So after market on the Monday, they announced that Brett Cairns was leaving... I decided if they weren't going to respond to my questions about Hamish, who I knew had separated from his wife, I was going to write the story on Tuesday for Wednesday's newspaper. And I did. Still hadn't heard from Magellan. I I followed them up. They still didn't engage. The story goes up online at lunchtime on the Tuesday. And as you can imagine, it gets a bit of a response. And then around dinner time, so I'm saying seven or hours later, after this story had been live, I get a call from Hamish. And Hamish, who's quite agitated, proceeds to tell me that my story is completely wrong. He's very close to his wife. They've never been closer, in fact. And they're spending Christmas together. They've spent all this time together. They're together right now. And um, it was a pretty strange situation because ordinarily, you this would be a catastrophe for a journalist. You'd hang mm. up and... Um, it would be, you know, you'd have to retract the story, have to issue a grovelling apology. Lord knows what you might have to offer in defamation. But we really were very solid. I was very solid on, on, on the story. And lo and behold, Wednesday comes around the next day and Magellan puts out a statement to the stock exchange from Hamish and his wife confirming that they split up months ago. Mm. So that for me was, I mean, it was a very highly stressful period of time. Didn't get a lot of sleep. And then less than two weeks after your article appeared, the UK wealth manager, St James Place, which had $23 billion with Magellan, decided to take their money and put it elsewhere. How did Hamish and Magellan respond? So we all break for Christmas, but right before we do... Hamish sits down for a fireside chat. Um, this week we announced that St James's Place, our largest client, uh, has uh, ended their uh, mandate with, uh, with Magellan. So their decision to withdraw doesn't have any impact on any other uh, clients. And importantly, it doesn't have that and larger impact he on our business. They, they represent- just lets loose on the media and on people who are seeking to portray this in, image of a nasty situation. divorce. Uh, at the end of the day, people have tried to create a, an image that my wife and I are in some nasty divorce. They, they, nothing could be fair. And uh, how dare people get involved in my private life and, you know, things are great between my wife and I and, and people should give us privacy. And, you know, all these stories and, and the suggestion that we would ever sell a single share in Magellan, I mean, it's just ludicrous. People were saying we're about to dump our shares in Magellan. This is just absurd. We've never sold a single share in Magellan. We actually put out a statement that we don't have any intention of selling any shares. in. in And I wasn't in a position to respond to that. It was summer and my column was up for for the break and I came back in February and was pretty keen to point out that actually the Financial Review had never suggested that Hamish was going through a nasty divorce. 
Uh, we just pointed out the likelihood of how it would end. It doesn't need to, a divorce doesn't need to be nasty for it to end in a separation of assets. But even still, nobody expected him to just vanish. And um, early February, Magellan puts out an announcement that Hamish is going on indefinite medical leave. I mean, nobody saw that coming. Yeah, that's right. Nobody did see it coming. And even in a recent interview uh, I did with the, the chairman of Magellan, Hamish McLennan, he expressed his shock on that day in February 6th when Hamish didn't come to work. That really knocked them off guard and they openly admit that they didn't quite have a plan for the moment when their talisman, their you know, their 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 main guy who's who'd built the company, uh, was in a position where he couldn't come to work. So up until that point there was no there was no denying that um, this was a difficult time for Magellan. They'd lost their CEO, Brett Cairns. They'd lost their biggest client. It was public knowledge now and acknowledged as such that Hamish Douglas was separated from his wife. But I guess the hammer blow was in late January, Netflix, which Magellan had just decided to make a big bet on, and Facebook came out with their fourth quarter earnings. And for both companies, they were dreadful and both stocks plunged. Now, Whatever hope there was of Magellan clawing its way back and recovering its performance, that evaporated pretty quickly. And not only did the um, resurrection not come, but the the numbers became even worse. So that day when Hamish said he was on medical leave, the stock plunged. And in a matter of months, if not weeks, billions of dollars had been wiped off the face value of the company. It was simply gone. So early in November... Hamish Douglas sold two-thirds of his interest, um, which is worth about $118 million. Had this sell-down been attempted around the peak, it probably would have been worth about $733 million more. And this sale came 11 months after he said in a joint statement that he had no intention of selling any Magellan shares. So, Johnny, where does all this leave Magellan, its employees and its shareholders? Well, there are certainly deep wounds as a result of this quite traumatic year that Magellan has experienced. I had a front row seat to what has been a, a very painful, shocking and traumatic year. Perhaps the ones that are feeling it most are the employees. Some of them bought shares in the 30s and $40 a share and now it's lingering in the 10s. Now the problem is they've got to repay these loans, but the shares that they own aren't worth anywhere near as much as, as the loans they're on the hook for. So... It's something that the chairman has acknowledged as a friction point, that they, they're effectively stuck at Magellan with large debt, so this job has actually cost them money and put them into debt. A lot of mum and dad investors were caught up in this. They, a lot of them, as Magellan's share price was falling, they were very familiar with Hamish Douglas and they thought there was value in catching a falling knife, so to say, um, and unfortunately that knife has kept falling. So a lot of mum and dad shareholders have felt the pain. The investors in Magellan... It's fair to say they've done okay. The context of this is Magellan funds didn't really lose money. They just fell very far behind what you could have achieved if you just invested in the market more broadly. So their poor performance affected them as a business more than it did their investors. But it did show Magellan up as not being the smartest guys in the room at the end of the day. They, They fell into line, if not behind the pack. So the unit holders didn't lose money, but it really affected Magellan more from a business and a shareholder sense. Now, Magellan is trying to rebuild. They've made what might prove to be quite an astute recruitment in hiring David George from the Future Fund. And the Future Fund have a reputation for being very cerebral and analytical about funds management and dissecting the way fund managers perform and can perform. And and so far, he's putting on a very brave face. Very hopeful face. Yes, that's right, a hopeful face. And then he's hoping his team can fix the numbers sooner rather than later. The more immediate issue for Magellan is coming up soon. There's an extraordinary uh, shareholder meeting where the directors are asking for their fees to be more than double. Now, this is something the chairman has acknowledged as the optics not looking particularly great after uh, probably one of the traumatic 12 months that any corporate has experienced. The directors are asking for money, for more money. But they're of the view that in order to attract the right talent, they need to do that. And and the message from the board is that this was a company and a business built around one man, Hamish Douglas. And the way the board fees were structured was 
because there was one man there that was going to make them all rich through their shareholdings. And now that dream has died. They have to have a big reset. So the optics are not great, but there is some recognition that this is a completely different company to what it was 12 months ago. So we've heard about how Hamish Douglas and Magellan scaled the heights of the funds management industry only to come tumbling down the other side. But what is the takeaway from this tale? I want to ask you both this. Is it the end of the era of the billionaire fund manager? And what role does the media play in helping to build the profiles of these cult-like figures? The media reflects what the public wants. And what we found out emphatically over the reign of Hamish Douglas is that the public wanted him and wanted to hear from him. And that desire is not going to change. And there's always going to be a need whether we find that key man or that key man finds us, for there to be that one person or people who we look to for guidance on where the markets are going. There's no doubt in my mind, Johnny, there will be another Hamish. I think everyone loves a winner and when markets are particularly tough, um, we probably crave that leadership even more. So it's up for grabs. You know, if somebody wants to take the mantle, like people are, people are paying attention. Well, the one thing they like more than winners is a comeback, but we almost never see comebacks in funds management. That's because it's just so hard to beat the market. Um, But one thing I will say is Hamish did so much for global equities in this market. I think people forget that. He lifted up everyone and uh, the awareness that he created in in global investing um, as a strategy probably did a lot of good um, to wake people up to that fact. And look, in discussing this issue with Joe, we have many, too many discussions about Magellan and, and the broader meaning of it all. But J- Joe's view was that it was an, it's the ultimate cautionary tale. Um, he says there's a story about the extent to which Australians need to believe that we have our own Warren Buffett. And there's a deep psychological need for us to have a saviour. And, and that's what Hamish was. He really was. And he filled the psychological need and he was really good at it. He, he, was, a, he was a marketing genius. There's no doubt about it. But I think if we have to look beyond that, um, this is also a corporate story of disruption. Now, Magellan were first movers. As Vesson said, they unearthed this, this huge opportunity in global equities. But over time, it became apparent that really they were selling a commoditized product at a premium fee. And it's only a matter of time before that that is found out. So ironically, Magellan, who traipsed around the world looking for the great companies that disrupt industries, were themselves the most vulnerable to disruption. Thanks both. Thanks for coming in and talking us through the Magellan story. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks for having us. the other big stories we're covering this week. Australia's economy grew by 0.6% in the September quarter to be 5.9% larger through the year. While this was a strong result, it came in slightly below market expectations. And economists said that in the months ahead, higher interest rates would affect consumer spending, which had been a key driver of growth. And Andrew Forrest has become Australia's biggest owner of renewable energy assets after the $4 billion acquisition of CWP Renewables. Forrest's Squadron Energy will control 2.4 gigawatts of wind, solar and firming projects, making the billionaire iron ore miner central to delivering on the country's emissions reduction ambitions. Thank you for listening to The Fin. I'm Lisa Murray with Vesna Polyak, Jonathan Shapiro and Joe Aston reporting today. The Fin is produced by Alex Gao and Lap Fan. Fiona Buffini is the executive producer. Our theme is by Alex Gao. If you like the show and want to hear more, follow us wherever you get your podcasts and consider rating and reviewing us as it helps others find us. For more stories about markets, business and power, subscribe to the Financial Review at afr.com slash subscribe. 
see you next week. The Australian Financial Review.